Hi everyone, it's Allison Miller again. This time I wanted to talk to you about antidepressants. It's not going to be a long video, I just want to review a few things so to make sure that you have some of the finer points understood for the exam. So the first thing I want to tell you is that there are several different kinds of antidepressants. You probably know all of them at this point. There are tricyclics, there are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, there are SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and there are MAOIs, plus there are some other types. Some people consider um, Welbutrin a tetracyclic, and some people call it just other. They don't really have a term for it, and some people have another term for it. I've seen it categorized different ways, so we'll just sort of lump them as the other uh, drugs, of which there aren't many. The first group that we can dispatch with pretty quickly are the MAOIs. Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are drugs that are the sort of the original antidepressants. We found out along the way, the hard way, that these are drugs that also can interact with certain kinds of foods that in a way that can be very dangerous to the patient, causing a life-threatening hypertensive crisis. So doctors are not very keen on prescribing these drugs anymore. But they're important to know about because they show up on the exam regardless. So what foods would MAOIs interact with? Well, I always try to tell people, just think of what you would eat at a tailgate party. Beer, wine, brats, hot dogs, those kinds of things. Anything that has tyramine in it is a food that's going to interact with these drugs potentially badly. So along the way, they decided to give, it, the problem is that MAOIs can be incredibly effective in treating difficult to treat depression. So they're terrific drugs, except for this one small problem, which is it could kill you if you eat the wrong kind of food. Um, the um, way around this is that the drug companies came up with a transdermal version of the MAOIs which is called MSAM, it's E-M-S-A-M, MSAM, and it's a transdermal patch. It bypasses the gut so it doesn't have the chances of interacting with the tyramines, uh, and so it's much safer for patients to be using, and doctors feel safer in prescribing it. Unfortunately, it has never really caught on, and so I almost never hear of anybody being prescribed MSAM, but you should know that there that that's the real problem with MAOIs. They're very effective drugs. They have very few side effects, um, but they do have this one little nasty little problem of interacting with foods that could actually end up killing the patient. So, so MAOIs, one category. They're the oldest of the group. Then there are the tricyclics. Tricyclics are um, drugs like uh, amitriptyline and um, nortriptyline, the older antidepressants. These drugs typically cause uh, lots of anticholinergic side effects, and the higher the dose, the more severe the side effects. So doctors often don't want to prescribe this because of it. They are contraindicated in patients that are elderly, that is to say anyone over 60 or 65. They don't want to prescribe it because it can really boost up the blood pressure and cause problems there. Another problem with um, tricyclics in addition to the um, uh, anticholinergic side effects and it being contraindicated in elderly, is that when somebody chooses to use that as their drug for overdosing, as a suicide attempt, it is really lethal. So people who are fragile and have had lots of suicide attempts um, and, and are in and out of suicidality, doctors do not want to typically have tricyclics in their possession because of the lethality of that uh, kind of overdose. The sad thing is that, it, again, for some people, tricyclics are exactly what they need, and um, uh, they can be life-saving. At low doses, sometimes they don't even cause side effects. So you will um, find in the, in the handout that I've sent you on antidepressants and uh, psychotropics in general, on the second page, you'll see four blocks, and the first block is a list of the SSRIs. The second block is a list of SNRIs, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then below that are the MAOIs and the tricyclics. So the MAOIs are drugs like 
um, Marplan, Nardil, MSAM, and Carnate. Again, drugs you're probably, it's possible you could go your entire career and never see these drugs prescribed anymore today. I used to see them when I was a younger nurse. Tricyclics are drugs like Elevil, um, Norpramin, Cinequin, Tofranil. Um, what are some of these others? Yeah, those are the ones, Anafranil maybe. But again, you're not likely to see those very often either. So let's go back to the ones that you see most often, especially in the hospital setting, the SSRIs and the SNRIs. The SSRIs are the typical ones we're talking about. Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, um, Celexa, Luvox, um, Brintelix is a new one. Luvox is typically not prescribed as an antidepressant per se. It's typically prescribed to help control uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, but it, it falls under the category of being a tricyclic, so you should know it and understand that it'll have uh, the typical tricyclic sort of issues of serotonin withdrawal or serotonin um, syndrome, which is sort of an overdosing of the drug uh, accidental. It's when the doctor prescribes too high of a dose for the patient to be able to handle. Um, so by the way, be sure to know the difference between serotonin uh, syndrome and serotonin withdrawal sin, uh, symptoms. So SSRIs, um, they're used to, to treat depression and PTSD, although I have to tell you that the research that's come out over the last five or seven years does not support um, these drugs as being particularly effective for symptoms of PTSD. They might help treat some of the depressive symptoms that come along with traumatic experiences and grief and loss and those kinds of things. But the PTSD symptoms themselves, it's not very effective, but they still prescribe it as if it's going to help them with PTSD, just so you know, you may see it that way. Side effects um, frequently cause sexual side effects, which is the number one reason that people discontinue use of these drugs. With the tricyclics, the number one reason is the dry mouth and the urinary retention. Um, and if the person just can't finish urinating, then the tricyclic has to be discontinued regardless. But most people get to that point and they stop the drug themselves. With SSRIs, it's, it's often the, um, uh, the sexual side effects where they just don't feel sexual, they can't orgasm, they can't have an, uh, any kind of sense of arousal. It's pretty distressing to young people who are experiencing that. Uh, with the SNRIs, we're talking about Cymbalta, Effexor, Pristique, um, Fetzema, which is something I haven't seen prescribed. Maybe you have, but I haven't seen it prescribed here much. I know it, uh, it was in Europe for a while. Um, SNRIs are looking at both serotonin and norepinephrine, and the double coverage can sometimes make a really big difference for some people. Be aware with these drugs in particular that they can be extremely difficult for the person to wean off of. I have seen patients try to wean off of Effexor for weeks to months and have a terrible time with the withdrawal symptoms, the, with the aftermath of trying to wean off of it. it can be very unpleasant and very difficult for some people. Um, Pristique, I haven't heard how difficult it is to get off of, but Cymbalta and Effexor, especially Effexor, can be really tough for them to, to wean off of. So if they're talking about how crummy they feel now that the doctor has stopped Effexor, it might not be, you should explore it more thoroughly because it might not be that they're feeling more depressed or that they're having um, a worsening of their original symptoms, but rather the withdrawal symptoms are making them feel awful and irritable. So be aware of that. Anytime the clinician discontinues or starts weaning down a psychotropic and the patient has a change in behavior or uh, starts complaining of things that they weren't complaining about before, check into whether or not this might be a side effect of the discontinuation of that drug. It often is. These are very powerful medications and they can really cause some problems when they start to decrease. All right. The next page is all about patient education teaching points. Um, things like making sure the patient understands that antidepressants take a while to work. It takes a while for the drug to, it isn't that it needs to build up a certain level, it's that it needs to uh, be available to certain synapses long enough for the synapses to actually uh, change and open back up again. 
That's the problem. The receptors need exposure to these medications for a period of time before they start to open back up and uh, do the job they were meant to do. The second is the patient should expect this medication uh, to be taken for at least six months. It's important that you set that expectation at the very beginning because we don't want the patient to get two months, three months into it and saying, this is awesome, I feel so much better. Boom, I'm discontinuing this medication because, you know, I'm not seeing my doctor for a while anyway. Why bother? Or I've run out of it and I'm not going to get a refill. The problem with not being on it for a steady period of time, an extended period of time, is that the brain doesn't have a chance to sort of stabilize in that newly opened, reopened state. And as soon as the medication goes away, the patient could uh, go back into a depression that may be much harder to treat next time around. So we want that medication in their bodies for 6 to 12 months, sometimes 18 months, just to make sure that the body has sort of stabilized at this um, new um, biological level. Okay. The third is each medication has its own unique properties. So when you look at, for instance, Lexapro and Celexa, um, one is citalopram and the other is escitalopram. Chemically, they are very similar, but just one molecule is a little bit different and it can have a totally different effect on the patient and um, the way in which the effectiveness of the drug works in the patient's body. So when a patient says something to you like, I have tried every medication out there, um, the doctor has tried all these antidepressants and nothing works, make sure that you challenge that. I don't mean aggressively, I mean asking them, tell me exactly which medications you've taken in the past. Usually a patient can only name about four of them. And it's our responsibility at that point to instill some hope by saying, well, let me tell you, there are 15 other medications that you still haven't tried. And even though they sound alike and sometimes they are chemically very similar, you never know how your body's going to react to any one medication. And you want to make sure that they know that there are still lots of things that the, the doctor can try, that they're not out of options at all. So each person uh, responds to each medication differently. And you should know also that each person responds differently to the medication as they go through their lifespan. So they may come in at 58 years old and say to the doctor, well, years and years ago I was on Elevil. And the doctor can start them on Elevil. And the patient can have terrible side effects from it because they are now 30 years older than they used to be. Um, so what used to work might not work anymore. Um, what seems to work for one person in the family doesn't work for anybody else in the family. Every, uni every, every medication is unique and every person's reaction to it is going to be unique. Um, you should include in your education that the positive effects of the medication may sort of wear off over time. That isn't actually what happens. The body adapts to it. And a slight change, meaning either, sometimes it's just a matter of increasing the dose a small amount. Sometimes it's, it requires with a few dosage changes and no improvement, it requires changing medications. Um, sometimes adding Abilify might bolster it, but that's up to the doctor. Just let them know that if they stop feeling good after six months to a year on this drug, that they should come right back into the doctor and talk to the doctor about that, that that's not uncommon. All right, so that's it on antidepressants. I just wanted to give you that quick little tutorial on it. Um, a quick comment about Welbutrin. Welbutrin is the same drug that they use for um, stopping smoking because it seems to have a, an anti-binging component to it. It seems to slow down cravings. So it's being tried out with people who have um, food cravings as well as smoking cravings. And it works for some people. Um, it can be very helpful for them. But it is an activating drug. It, it can make people who have anxiety a lot more anxious if they're prone to it. So, uh, and it can make people sleepless. So taking it at night is probably not a good idea. Um, the SSRIs are also activating. Serotonin tends to be an activating kind of neurotransmitter, but the TCAs tend to be sedating, so you want to take those at night. SSRIs in the morning, Wellbutrin in the morning, those kinds of things. 
Um, I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions about any of the antidepressants, feel free to drop me a note or give me a call on my phone. And um, in the meantime, I hope you have a great day. Bye.